as a professor of archaeology and the history of antiquity. I wrote about a lot of topics. Most of them were what I would call serious archaeological topics. That's why you don't know me. I wrote about stuff that most people are not interested in. If it was interesting, I didn't write about it, so I apologize for that. But somewhere in the early 90s, I got a call from a guy by the name of Myron Widmer. And uh, Myron uh, called me one day, and then he wrote me a letter after that, and he said, I need you to, to do some research on Noah's Ark. There's a lot of interest in Noah's Ark. Would you do something about it? Uh, do some research on it. So honestly, I, I believe in the flood. I have no question about it. I believe there was a literal flood. Lasted just the way the Bible said. I, I believe that that explains a lot of issues that if you don't have the flood, makes a problem. For example, the geological column and so forth. But I always assumed that if I were in Noah and I got off the ark in the mountain somewhere, that I wouldn't want to use it as a worship place, but I might use it as a house. I might even take it apart and use it to build, uh, build um, a cart or something like that, and that over time people would use it up. That's kind of my assumption, and that's where I was in my mind when he asked me to search about it. So I kind of started the issue, what I would say is fairly uh, un, unbiased, just trying to find out what I could learn about the subject. One thing I did learn is that Noah's Ark can be found almost anywhere. For example, in this news clipping, uh, Noah's Ark is discovered in <laughs> Pennsylvania. You think it was found in Pennsylvania? No, but people talk about it like it's found almost everywhere all the time. Now, one of the things you're going to find that I want to do is that for me, the biblical text is the most important thing. Yes. So if it's inspired writing, I'm going to start right out there before I jump to anything else. And the first thing I discovered, I started out in the Genesis, and I'm going to ask you to read it with me in your saved and sanctified voices now that we are all rejuvenated by the hymns. We're going to sing it, read it nicely together. Genesis 8, 4. This is what we're going to read all together. In the seventh month... On the seventh day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. Now I want you to notice something that a lot of people miss. And that is, that what does it say? Mountains, Mountains plural, in Ararat. And, and a lot of people miss that. So they automatically think that if you look at that picture in the background, which is something I took myself in eastern Turkey, right at the Bay is that looking at traditional... Uh, Mount Ararat, that tradition goes way back about 100 years. It's not a very long tradition, but about 100 years ago they said that was really Ararat, and so people have re kept it all the time. But many people forget that it's the mountains of Ararat. Now why is it called the mountains of Ararat? Well, as you might have heard from your pastor sometime, when the biblical text was written, people at that time did not use vowels. They only used consonants. So the consonants in use of Ararat are RRT. See RRT? And another way of saying it, depending on what language is used, when, when I took Hebrew at the seminary, there was a lady teacher named Leona Running. She's now passed. But she always liked to talk about the Canaanite shift. And I would say to her, Oh, oh, Dr. Running, is that a kind of a dance, the Canaanite shift? And she would not even smile. She was, she was a very serious, she wouldn't even smile. She'd say, Merlin, just keep quiet, or something like that. You know, she and I were really close. <laughs> just, Merlin, keep quiet. It really has to do with the shift of the vowels. That if you're a certain language, then it's a shifting of the, of the way you pronounce the, the vowels. Just the way there might be a difference in enunciation from Texas and Virginia might be just a little bit different because people have a different dialect. And in history, there are a people called, who lived in a place called Urartu. Okay? Urartu is a specific area known in history. And when the Bible says the mountains of Ararat, it's talking about the place called the mountains of the Urartu. Okay? And those are, that's, that's known in history. Notice it's not something I've made up. It's, this is a map I found with the Urartu area delineated like that. And that whole area in eastern Turkey around Lake Van, see Lake Van there? Does this thing actually have a pointer? No. Here, I'll, I'll use this one. You see Lake Van right there? You see Lake Van? 
that whole area generally around Lake Vaughan was the home of the Urartu. Now, unfortunately, the Urartu didn't live in the time of Noah, but later on, that name was applied. That's called what we would call an anachronistic use of the name, the Urartu. Now, that's a big fancy word, but let me explain. It's very simple. If any of you knew my wife before I married her, you might say to someone, you know, I knew Stephanie Merling when she was a girl. Was that her name when she was a girl? No, that's an anachronistic use. That means we've taken a name from later and then applied it to a period earlier. And so the Bible talks about the mountains of the Urartu. But the Urartu didn't live in the time of, the, of, of Noah's Ark. Uh, they lived somewhat later. But the writer, the latest writer, the translator, who passed on the manuscript uh, from one guy to the next, made a note of where that area is. So thankful to him, we know generally where the Ark was located in the mountains of the Urartu. Okay, here's uh, another picture. And, and I'm, as I said... About a hundred years ago or so, the large mountain in, the, in this, the largest mountain in the Urartu region is a place called Arida. Arida is that little white speck right there. And uh, that is the mountain that you saw in the picture that we began with. And it has become the place called Mount Ararat in the last 100, 120 years as recent explorers have tried to go up there. And uh, it has, uh, it's an interesting mountain because it is the only mountain in all eastern Turkey that has a, a perpetual glaciers on it. So anytime you go there, you're going to see a mountain like that in the summer. The picture I showed you at the beginning is the picture of the way it looks now in the winter or summer. In the winter time, it has more glaciers unless they kind of recede and more and recede in history as it is. Now, here's another picture. It's not a very easy picture, but this is the Bayezet. It doesn't show you the mountain under the Bayezet is the city just to the south of this Arida, or I'm going to call it traditional Mount Sinai. I'm going to say that all the time because I've been working on Mount Sinai too for tomorrow. So I'm in the traditional Mount Ararat. So every time I say Mount Sinai, you're going to say, you mean Mount Ararat, okay? So that'll keep me in line. I'll say, oh yeah, and eventually... By the two or three hours, I'll, I'll have that just right. Okay, now I want to tell you that I was really fortunate. Any of you ever heard of Joe Cruz? Yeah. Okay, I'll just toot my own horn by saying Joe Cruz, when I was a young kid, invited me to work for Amazing Facts long years ago. And unfortunately, I already went to Alabama and I didn't get a chance to do that, but I, I love Joe Cruz, think he does a great work. Well, the reason I told you about him is not him. His son was one of my students at the seminary. And in the time, one of the best students I had the whole time, he actually works for the White Estate now, Larry Cruz. And when Larry was my student, he said, uh, Dr. Merling, when, when can we go to climb Mount Ararat? And I said, well, you know, I'm finished this big project. When I get done with that, well, we'll go then. And, well, I did get finished with that. And uh, he, I called him and said, hey, I'm finished my project. Let's do it this summer. And so we agreed to meet in Istanbul, Turkey, rent a van, and drive to the distance to eastern uh, Turkey to this area, right to Debeazet and all that area. He had my wife, he had his wife, and he, had, he brought a friend. His friend's name was John McIntosh. Now that was, I think, 96, I think it was. Uh, this, uh, what's interesting is this, this week, John McIntosh and I still email, not regularly, but I, I was trying to get prepared to be with you, and I'm checking, checking on the most recent information so I could give you the best. Well, on the way over, I discovered that John McIntosh was really a believer. I'm going to tell you part of his story now, and then I'll tell you the rest later. John McIntosh was trained at Purdue University, and he has a master's degree in um, geoscience research or something like that, and he, he, when he graduated with that, he went to California and taught in a high school, did that the rest of his career in, uh, in California. And uh, the interesting thing was when he got to California, he got to visiting with people and he became a Christian. And he was excited about being a Christian. They invited him one day to a Bible study. He went to the Bible study. And would you believe what the Bible study was about? It was about Noah's Ark. He said, you know, 
finally I know what God had in mind for me. John, in his years at Purdue in Indiana, had, got, had, uh, had learned how to climb mountains. He had all the equipment for climbing mountains. He was a spelunker. That's the ones who don't go up the mountain. They make a mistake and they go down in the hole. He was a spelunker. He had all the equipment. And when he went to that Bible study, he said, Oh, praise God, I know what God has in mind for me. That is to find Noah's Ark. So you know that in summers, teachers don't work. They just loaf all the summer. So uh, what my wife's uh, in the school system. I'm just teasing her even though she's not here. Um, she, uh, he, he decided what he would do. He'd go to Turkey the next year. So he had no, never been out of the country, didn't have a passport, didn't know anything about Turkish, didn't know anything, but he found a place on the map, had enough money saved, because those teachers make so much money, I guess, saved, that he flew into Turkey, not speaking a word of English, not knowing what to do. He went all the way to Debeazet, the place I showed you on the map. He went there, didn't speak a word, didn't know what to do. He went to a police station and asked them in good, perfectly good California English, uh, can you give me permission to climb Mount... Uh, what's the word? Air rat. And of course, they didn't understand a word he said. He spent three days, what I call arm flapping and arm waving and trying to talk to them. And by the end of three days, they said to him whatever he thought they said meant that he could climb the mountain. So three days later, he goes out to the mountain, gets a ride by somebody to the base of the mountain, and then he starts climbing right up the top. Not, no sooner had he started than he sees a whole bunch of policemen coming behind him. He's not sure what to do, but he knows one thing, he can outclimb them. So he just climbs up one side of Mount Ararat and down the other and runs out of the country. <laughs> that begins a process in which he came every single year for more than 20 years. And that's about the time that I met him, and I'll tell you more of his story as we go on. Okay. So he is the one. Many of the slides, probably half of the ones you're going to see at the first half, came directly from him. He gave me everything. He gave me hours of videotape for me to peruse through and make copies of this. He has been very good. And many of the slides at the beginning are going to be his that he shared with me that he uses in presentation. That's why we were in contact again earlier this week to get more stuff from him to tell you uh, because he keeps up on the search for Noah's Ark. I don't keep up with it that well. Uh, but because there were, I knew there were new things, I wanted you to, to know about it. And I have a lot of friends still in the archaeological community who have helped me with this presentation as well. Okay, let's go to the search for Noah's Ark. And this is what I'm going to say. This is my summation of what I understood John McIntosh to be telling me after tens of hours going all the way to eastern Turkey and hearing all of it and then communicating with him and writing down the information. And this is it. 90%, 99%, 100% of all that I've heard about Noah's Ark is what I call anecdotal and problematic. Anecdotal and problematic. Well, what, what do I mean by anecdotal and problematic? Well, let's kind of look at it. Here's, a, here's the story of a guy by the name of Haji Yaram. Haji Yarm, I'm not going to read it all because I'm going to save time, but I'll, I'll kind of summarize it here. His first sighting of the Ark in modern times took place around 1856. And according to his story, a group of English scientists came to, uh, to his house and invited he and his father to take them up the mountain and show them Noah's Ark. The father said, of course I know where Noah's Ark. There's no problem. I've been in it many times. And... Uh, so they went up the mountain together, he and his father, and they showed him Noah's Ark, and the men, the English men, most of them scientists, were angry. And they said, if you tell anybody else about this, we're going to come back and we're going to burn your house down. That's the story of Ahaji Yaram. Okay, uh, what else am I going to tell you? Okay, we'll tell you about James Bryce, another anecdotal story. James Bryce was a British ambassador uh, to Turkey, and... Uh, he, because he was a British ambassador, he had the power and the right to get most of the things he wanted. One of the things was to go on Mount Ararat, where he climbed on Mount Ararat, and lo and behold, what did he find on Mount Ararat was wood. And his uh, conclusion, climbed the mountains in 1876, and he found timbers. Now, what's so important about finding wood on top of the summit? 
Well, the wood found on this mountain is hand-hewn, extremely hard, and there's not wood to be found for 200 miles. So Bryce concluded, what else could it be? It has to be wood from Noah's Ark. All right, no wood, and you look around, you don't see any trees, you don't see those uh, groves of trees anywhere because it's e eastern Turkey, very dry like the rest of the Middle East. You don't have trees there. So what else could it be if you found wood in the top of the mountain? So, okay, there's another guy, Prince Nori. Prince Nori was an interesting guy. He claimed to be the Archbishop of Babylon and the head of the Christian Nestorian Church. And in his work as a Archbishop, he was traveling up and down the Euphrates. He came within sight of the mountain that I'm calling traditional Mount uh, Ararat. Thank you very much. And uh, he climbed to the top. And when he got up there, he found wood. And he saw the wood and he took measurements of it. Notice in the second paragraph, took measurements and found that his measurement coincided exactly with what the Bible said. Uh, in, his, in his writings, he recounts his experience and is certain that he discovered Noah's Ark, Prince Nori. And then there's the discussion of the, of the Turkish expedition. In the Turkish expedition, they're sent out by the Tsar to find Noah's Ark. They come down to eastern Turkey, they climb up, and lo and behold, they find uh, the, um, uh, the evidence of Noah's Ark. But there's one problem. Notice in the second paragraph, the, 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 they sent back all the information, all the pictures, all everything, uh, to the Tsar of Russia, but they're lost during the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, revolution including all of the photographs, maps, and reports. Now, I will tell you that in the issue of Noah's Ark, there's one thing that I've learned, almost without question, all of the evidence has the tendency, like many of the grade school kids have the problem at school, that the dog eats it. One way or the other, when it comes to actually seeing the evidence, there's always some problem because the dog came along and ate it. In this case, the dog is the Bolshevik Revolution. But you don't have any evidence, you just have the words that are there. Let's skip that one and let's go to uh, Jorge Habgopian. I don't want to take a lot of time with these, I'm just kind of giving the, the summation of the kind of things that we're talking about uh, because I added another 20 minutes tonight for tonight's that I hadn't done before. Jorge Habgopian. Now here's a picture of Jorge Habgopian with Alfred Lee. Alfred Lee is a Seventh-day Adventist. He was an artist for the Adventist uh, Review, uh, Review and Herald for years, and he had great interest in art searches and so forth. And he met um, Jorge Habgopian and uh, drew a picture of what his ark looked like. And uh, here's what I'm going to tell you about Alfred Lee. He's been involved in the search for Noah's Ark from 1969 to 2001. Uh, Alfred's uh, era spans many important relationships. Ferdinand Navari, the search, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And uh, he also drew a picture of the Ark from Jorge Habgopian. And according to Jorge, this is how the Ark looked. Right? All right, so that's clear. And then there's Ferdinand Navari. That reaches into my era. Well, I remember this uh, happening in the, I think it was in the 50s as a child. I remember people talking about it. Here's the book that Ferdinand Navari, Navarro wrote about it. And here's a picture of him standing with one of the timbers that he found. So that's very impressive that we've actually got someone who's seen the ark, found the remnants of the wood that is there. All right, because of that, uh, a bunch of organiz organizations started up called the Cirque Foundation of a number of Christian people who were determined to go up there and see what was left of the ark themselves. Uh, this is the group of the people. There's uh, Ferdinand Navarre in the middle. There's Alfred Lee on the right. Here's uh, the other three guys I don't know. But they were, they're the one, the founding committees, and they got together and they decided they would climb the mountain and see this ark for themselves. There's a picture from the book of how they went up to the mountain. Next guy, this is one of the guys I would have liked to have met, especially uh, George Green. George Green was a geologist and he had enough clout in his work to have the ability to have a helicopter to his disposal. And periodically he would fly around uh, uh, traditional mount 
air at and look for uh, the, uh, the, the boat. And lo and behold, one day the, the weather had produced enough uh, dry back so that he could see uh, Noah's Ark right in front of him. Took a lot of pictures, went real close in the helicopter, took a lot of pictures and uh, that kind of thing, uh, demonstrating that he had found Noah's Ark. Another person who claims to have seen Noah's Ark is a guy by Ed Davis. Now this really comes close to my era. I just was doing other work and, and this was also involving Albuquerque because he lived in Albuquerque where I live now and I would have liked to have followed him. I've watched hours of videos of him being, uh, being translated and they were listening to him tell his story of how he saw uh, Noah's Ark. Um, Here's what the ark looked like to him. He said it was like a, two broken pieces that come across from different parts of the boat were in different sides of the, what we would say in the Middle East, Wadi. Uh, forget what we call that. Two different parts of the mountain here uh, where the, the boats were placed. And that's what he said it looked like. All right, so you have this anecdotal evidence. I kind of want to go through it because all of them have an interesting, what I would call caveat to the story. We have Haji Yarm, and George Havgopian, you have James Bryce, Ferdinand Navarra, Prince Nari, George Green, Turkish ex Expedition, and Ed Davis. Now, beyond just what they said about it, there are always things in my mind that make it a little bit problematic. Now, what do I mean by problematic? For example, you have the story of Haji Yaram and Jorge Havgopian. The, both, of these, both of these men have a similar story. Both of them claim that they saw the ark when they were small children, seven, eight, or nine. And they didn't tell anybody about it until they were 70 or in the 80s. Now, both of them the same. The evidence of both these men is their childhood memories, eight, nine years of age, 70 or 80 years after the event. Now, I don't know if you would want to be in a courtroom where somebody is making a claim against you of something that happened 70 years before. I don't know how you feel about it, but I would not put that as very high evidence. Not that the memory would be uh, not true, but time has a way of distorting things. You know, I, I, my wife I, I always kind of embarrasses me. I always tell the true story of how she came and, and uh, proposed to me. But you know, in the 45 years, she's kind of forgotten how that was. And she always counters and says, you know, it's not the way it was. It was, it was uh, you know, you actually proposed to me. But she, she's just forgotten after 45 years. Well, what, what happens is going to be in 70 years because she and I agreed to get married for 50 years. We've got five more years of that contract. And then if it works out, we're going to go another 50 years. So I have a feeling in 70 years, she might really be telling a strange story here. <laughs> so I'm not very secure that someone who told who saw something 70 or 80 years before is that reliable for me. I might wonder if they saw something, they thought it looked like a formation of some kind, but then after the time it kind of developed a little bit more in their mind and it grew a little bit more and it became a little more like a boat shape. So not to say they're dishonest, but the ravages of time do a lot to uh, mental picture what people think about and so I I kind of find, find that problematic That's why I said this anecdotal anecdotal is what you say and then problematic has to do with how you would evaluate that Well, let's talk about James Bryce. You know, he was an ambassador. He was no seven or eight year old child He was an ambassador. How could it be anything but the truth? Well, the problem is he found wood. That's what he knows his only thought was, I found wood up there. It's got to be Noah's Ark. That's only because that's all he knew. He didn't know what we know, that historically, for number two, we know a number of wood items have been on Mount Ararat, including a church and a cross. Because what happened in the Byzantine period between the 400s and the 800s, a lot of people, a lot of uh, sincere Christians were on pilgrimages. And they would climb up on their knees all kind of strange places, carrying all kind of heavy things like, our, like crosses and so forth. And there was even known historically written about a church that was up there. So maybe, I mean, is it just as possible 
that the wood he found was from a church as from uh, an ark? That's why I say that his evidence is kind of more problematic. He doesn't have any evidence that it was from the ark. He just found a piece of wood up there. How about Prince Nari? Well, first, the interesting thing for me is that no record has ever been found providing evidence of his membership in the Christian Nestorian Church. Now, you know, one of the things in the seminary everybody's talking about uh, is what has happened in our society, that people are not like they used to be, that there's a wave of, of uh, new way of looking at stuff. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think, what, we, what do we call that now, Pastor? Pastor? Um, um, when it comes to truth, people are not... Part, yeah, postmodern, that's the terminology. The people have become postmodern. And by postmodern, they mean that there's no such thing as demonstrable truth. That things kind of have to have a variety of meaning. Now, I'm kind of, I'm kind of old-fashioned. Excuse me, I haven't, I haven't taken the tea of postmodernism yet. And to me, if something is true, it is true. And if it's not true, it is not true. And so I kind of go by the way if, if something, someone tells me something that's not really true, um, then I kind of look at them a little bit sufficient, suspicious and I'm not likely to loan them $20. That, that's the bottom line. I don't have money much. And if they are not truthful, I'm not going to loan them 20 bucks probably. Does that, does that seem, I don't know about Virginia, but where I'm from, if somebody is dishonest in one area, that makes me a little bit cautious in other areas. Is that anybody else like that? Well, in any case, people, I mean, serious researchers have found the records of the, of the, uh, the uh, Christian Nestorian Church, and they've searched those records. First of all, Nari is not in those records. That, to me, is problematic right there. Secondly, when people wrote about uh, Prince Nari, only some of his friends believed his story. Some people said, yeah, I believe him, but only some of them. The others said, no, that wasn't really the way it was. And then the third thing, he spent his last years of his life in a mental institution. No offense to people who suffer from emotional problems. But that, again, makes me wonder how far back his emotional problems went. He says he was the archbishop. Can't find any records of that. Only some of his friends believe him, the others didn't. And then he had eventually mental problems. That kind of makes me... Do you see how I could see that's problematic? What year? What year? He, he was in the latter part of the 19th century. It, you know, I'm not sure about that. I can only tell you what I know, not what I don't know. But that's, you're, you're probably right. It could have been. All right. In any case, there is Prince Nari. And now we come to Ferdinand Navarra. He's up to, my, up to my time period. Well, first of all, the wood of his finds have all been dated to the Byzantine period. So in other words, what happened, he came down with wood, he said it was from Noah's Ark, it was sent to a lab, they did carbon-14 because carbon-14 starts about 1950 or 51 or 52 in there, and this is in the 60s, I think, or 50s, sent it for carbon-14, and every piece of wood went from the 400 to 800 A.D. after Christ. And we would expect that wood from Noah's Ark would be B.C., long before the time of Christ, instead of several hundred years afterwards. So that's problematic for me. Number two, on the search expedition, which he went with all those other scientists, he didn't find wood until he was alone. In other words, all those guys went up with him and he was supposed to show them the way where he found Noah's They couldn't find it. But one morning early, he got up before everybody else an hour or two, and he came back with a piece of wood again. And then they wanted to see where that was found. He couldn't find that place either. That's problematic for me. And then third, his son who went with him on the original trip always refused to talk about it. Never did an interview with anyone, as far as I know, in his whole life. That's kind of curious to me. So we have an anecdotal count. That is a statement about what a person said they found. But then when you look at it closely, it's problematic. The wood is several hundred years after the time of Christ. <coughs> Secondly, uh, they're not able to find it again except when he's by himself. 
And then the third is son doesn't say anything about it. So to me, these are problematic issues. Okay, then finally I mentioned the Turkish uh, expedition just quickly. Uh, we've tried to, we, <coughs> anybody have a cough drop? I'm sorry, I'm straining my voice here a little bit. The, uh, my, my, the art searchers who are my friends have tried very quickly, uh, very thoroughly, to find any record of this Turkish expedition. Thank you very much. What I just, I get the thing, that's fine, one is good. I get to thinking about uh, speaking louder and then I s pretty soon I'm straining and then I'm coughing, I'm fine. I like to be a baby though, so that's good, thank you. <laughs> that's the best thing I do is be baby. My art searching friends have searched all the newspaper records they can find and you can do a lot by just using your computer, but they've spent weeks and months trying to find any record of this Tur Turkish expedition. And the only place they found it is in a religious journal called the Prophetic Messenger from 1884. And looking all the New York Times and all the other papers in that time period, they weren't able to find anywhere else except this religious paper. And I want to tell you, if you found something like Noah's Ark, wouldn't you think it might hit the regular newspapers? Shouldn't that tell us something? If you find some amazing find and you only hear about it in church, isn't that odd? I mean, if I came here tonight to tell you I had the cure for cancer, wouldn't you be curious right then why you didn't hear about it in CNN or Fox News? Or uh, wouldn't, you, wouldn't that make you a little curious right there? The cure for cancer, isn't that a big deal? Cure for cancer, woohoo, woo. And I want to tell you finding Noah's Ark would be an amazing, amazing find. That's why when you hear it here in church and other places, like small venues, you hear of a different one every other week or every other month. And that's the way many of these claims for Noah's Ark in. There's always another one coming next year if you don't want to believe the one this year. Because if it's really true, then you have evidence and then you hear it worldwide. All right, so, oh, George Green. I forgot about George. George Green would have been a guy I liked. He was an adventuresome guy. He was a geologist, he took pictures, they took pictures. Well, when his job was over there, he went to South America. And in South America, he continued his geological work, and there he was murdered, and the dog ate all of the photographs. Not one is left. And when my art searching friends tried to find all of his friends, some of the 200 people claimed who had been George Green's friend, claimed to have seen the, the pictures, and some of them, most of them said they kind of did look like, like a boat a little bit. But that's the most they would say. He claimed, I found Noah's Ark. His friend said, yeah, I saw the pictures. It kind of did look like a boat a little bit. To me, that's not resounding evidence that we have found in Noah's Ark. Okay, Ed Davis, oh, the guy at the end who lived in Albuquerque. Ed Davis tells an interesting story. He's in Turkey as a military guy. And one day, he says to his uh, driver of his Jeep, Hey, I've been reading the Bible. Do you know that Noah's Ark came right in this area? And the Ark driver says, well, Of course. I mean, the Jeep driver says, Of course. My family knows where it is. I've been there many times. Oh, really? Can I go? Oh, yes. So Ed Davis goes to the village the first time. The weather's too bad. He comes back. Goes again a second time, weather's too bad, can't, can't get there, come back. Third time he gets there, the water, oh, the water, the weather is marginal. And so his friend takes him, climbing up the mountain to see Noah's Ark, and they get within a mile, about a mile, and at a mile's distance, they said, the weather's too bad, you have to look through this drizzle. And through the drizzle of the rain a mile away, he saw what he thought was Noah's Ark. And from that he came down. Now, the, the guys I showed you the picture of there, they really wanted to know the truth. One of the guys paid for a lie detector test. And in the report that I read about this, the guy wrote in there, I know that what he said is true. So I got on the phone, called the guy. And I said, hey, I, I just saw the video that once you were in there, you talked about Ed Davis telling the truth. So you believe the, the lie detector test said that Ed Davis is telling the truth. That's what you said in the video. No, he said, I didn't say that. What I said was, I believe that Ed Davis believed that he saw the ark. 
I'm not saying that he saw the ark, but I think that Ed Davis believed that he saw the ark. But he saw it from a mile through a drizzling rain. Again, I find that a little problematic. That would be problematic. I'd hate to be convicted of a crime based on somebody seeing me from a mile away in the drizzle. And that's what I feel about these evidence. Trying to give it the, the most careful read that I can give. Okay. And recent, this is an example of the most recent thing I know of, and this is what I spent a little time on this week. The Chinese, you know the Chinese were involved in this? They claimed, I think it was 08, and several years before, 06, 07, and 08, those guys claimed they'd found it several times and broadcast it several times, and here they, here they are. I don't know why they're eating, but this is right off the web. I got this so you can do it, find the same thing. Noah's Ark, they call it Nambi. Uh, NAMBI, which means Noah's Ark Ministries International. And uh, there's a group of them right there who claimed that they went on top of, Noah, uh, top of Mount Ararat and there they found Noah's Ark. Kind of interesting because you know where they say it is? In a cave. And they show pictures of a cave and they say it's inside that cave. Now, it so happened when I was an archaeologist, I made quite a few friends. I was the president of the Near Eastern Archaeological Society, and one of my members of my society was this, uh, oh, this is one of the things that they showed from their website. Here's this, these, it's not very clear because it's all in a cave. They didn't have any flash equipment or anything. They just showed natural lighting. But here you see, they can see bit, maybe some uh, wood, and here you can see some cobwebs. Now my friends who've kind of investigated this are curious because there are no cobwebs of any kind on top of Noah's Ark. This is at, I think it's 14,000 feet. You don't find a lot of cobweb making animals up there at that distance. And so my friends are kind of suspicious about that and a few other things, for example. Here is, uh, oh, let me get his name. I'm not gonna be able to say it today. I, I don't talk to him very often. Yeah, Randall Price, I'm sorry. This is Randall Price. Randall Price was contacted by the Chinese like 06 and asked him to work with them as a consulting archaeologist and the verification of the finds there. And uh, I got this off of Randall's, uh, off of uh, Price's website. And this is what he says. I'm going to read it slowly. You can make of it what you want. But he was associated with them for a long time and then he got cut off from the guy whose name is Parachute, believe it or not, his name is Parachute. He didn't like some of the things that Price said, and uh, they're no longer affiliated with him, but I want to read about it, and I'll show you some more pictures. I would like first to say that my remarks are not intended to question the sincerity or integrity of Noah's Ark Ministries International. It is my belief that those in this ministry are sincere Christians who, like myself, believe in the historicity of the biblical account of the great flood of Noah's Ark. I do, however, question their discernment of persons and of procedures and their zeal to discover the remains of Noah's Ark. And this is one thing I would say. Sometimes we are so interested, we're so zealous for finding something that proves the Bible that we kind of miss some of the finer points that show that maybe it is not what it seems to be. And then many people would get persuaded because of their enthusiasm, not because of what the Bible or the history or the archaeology says. However, I question the discernment of persons and procedures in their zeal to discover the remains of Noah's Ark. This conclusion is based on evidence which is of a different nature than what that which they have produced. It is the evidence of observation, experience, and professional evaluation of persons, events, and date that surrounds the discovery. Okay, and then he has a reassessment of the thing. I'm just going to go through it quick. There are 10 in here, and I'm sorry it's going to take a little bit of time. But I want you to hear of somebody who's been on the mountain multiple times, worked with the people of Danby, uh, Noah's Ark um, International Ministry. He says, in 1908, archaeologist Dr. Randall Price and the geologist Don Pat uh, Patton and David McQueen went to Debezet at the invitation of Nami to attend their press conferences concerning their first discovery of wood from Noah's Ark and to view and conduct tests on the sample of wood obtained for the cave on Mount Ararat. Number two, 
In February of 08, geologists Don Patman and Don Shockey, also a veteran ARCS researcher and explorer in Mount Ararat, went to Hong Kong to deliver the report of the team's geological analysis of the sample to NAMI. Their report was that the sample was volcanic tuff rock and not wood. However, they sought to partner with NAMBI, sharing American satellite data of the possible location of the ark as the basis for a joint expedition to the summit in 08. This agreement was made and a joint team was formed. Number three, in June of 08, NAMBI Representative Clara Wheatway conducted the American, contacted the American team members with news that their guide paraset, a parachute, that's how it said, parachute, had located the ark and had been inside and told us to come immediately and we would all be taken to it, that is the ark. The American team assumed that this discovery was based on the satellite and data shared with the Chinese team. We asked for photos and for a fee of 17,000 euros, we were emailed eight photos of pottery vessels inside a dark room. Parachute promised to show us photos of the structure when we arrived in Vaughan, you know, Lake Vaughan, we talked about it. Number four, in July of 08, Parachute demanded 120,000 euros up front in order for the expedition to take place. We felt it was wisest to pay half up front, but the Chinese said that Parachute wouldn't accept it and required it all for permits and equipment. We sent 60,000 euros, what is that? Almost $100,000 in fulfillment of our role as partners. Number five, in late, August of 08, we met the Chinese team in Istanbul and went together to a hotel in Vaughan. That night, Parachute showed us the same photos described to us by Clara. However, the cave in the photos had a tree and other foliage in front, and the wood structure with the door was a rock-cut tomb. How many believe Noah's Ark could be inside a rock-cut tomb? All right, number six. In September of 08, Parachute pretended to train some local climbers for the ascent to the site. However, he did not let us train. We were told that we would have to be tested to see if we could climb. Remember, Parachute had said originally they would take all of them to the site and then stated that the conditions were too difficult for us to make the climb. Number seven. In late September, we were visited by Dr. Richard Bright, a veteran ARC researcher who had climbed Mount Ararat 30 times, including several times with Jim Irwin, the U.S. astronaut. We had met him at the press conference in, in January and had started email correspondence. He invited us to make a climb to a new location with a Kurdish shepherd who claimed to have witnessed the ark at the site when a boy. Since we had come to climb and Parachute would not, not climb, we accepted the offer. And in early October, our American team climbed to uh, 3963 meters, about 13,000 feet, to investigate the site and to interview the shepherd concerning the testimony. Number eight. In October of 2008, upon return from the mountain, we were told that Parachute was very angry, that we had climbed the mountain with one of his competitors. Another Kurdish guy told us he knew about Parachute's scheme to cheat the Chinese. We were told that we told this while we were still with the Chinese and communicated our concern for the possibility, this possibility to them. However, at this point, we didn't trust either man and were trying to make an, our assessment. Number nine, in mid-October 2008, Dr. Don Patton and Dr. Randall Price spoke at the Noah's Ark and Mount Ararat Sym Research Symposium in Debezet. After the symposium, Clara Wei, who had stayed behind when the rest of the Chinese team had returned to Hong Kong, asked to meet, us, meet with us. She said the parachute had now given them the photos of the structure, and if we would remain partners, we could see them. We agreed. We then received the photos, the same being distributed today, and returned to the U.S. And finally, number 10, after the late April 2010 press conference, Clara con contacted the American team and said that they had wanted us to be part of the team. Uh, then she has uh, letters in there, but Parachute would not allow it. That's a summation of Randall Price and his involvement with this Chinese group. Here's a picture of, of this guy named Parachute. Okay, this is a picture of the geological team. There's Randall Price and a Chinese guy along with uh, Dan, uh, Don Patton, the guy second from the end. Um, and they went primarily uh, part of the U.S. geological team with wood samples in 2008. There's a large sample of so-called wood. All right. This, I'm going to about get done with this because it's too more complicated. But let me give you an example. This is the kind of thing that typically the average person cannot check. So people who want to be 
disingenuous or just want to convince people can put something out as evidence, but, mo but they assume that most people cannot check them out. And here's a flyer, the greatest discovery in modern Noah's Ark history, the unearthing of large wood structure on Mount Ararat. And here we have a list of all the things that demonstrate where this location is. And you'll notice the arrow on there. That arrow was placed there by Randall Price, not by me. Because it shows somebody, I don't know if you can tell from the distance, wading in water in a, in a cave where water is flowing out of this Noah's Ark site, which is supposedly in a cave. Here is a tourist area within 50 kilometers of of uh, Mount Ararat, traditional Mount Ararat, north of the Bay of Zed. Notice what he, what uh, Randall Price has put at the top. Hot Springs near Dubayadin, 50 miles west of Mount Ararat. And what do you have there? Here you have these formation, limestone formation. People, this is standing on the top and people come over here to swim and so forth in this cave. Here is a picture taken from the slides of parach parachute saying, notice at the bottom, a cave researched on what? Mount Ararat. This cave is 50 kilometers from Mount Ararat. And supposedly when they went in there, they were able to find Noah's Ark. Here's Randall Price. Same cave. This is just him later on saying, look, you do, did you tell the difference? You just see there? There's the cave that supposedly Noah's Ark in. Here's Randall Price 50 miles away in the same cave watching the water. And here, okay, I didn't put the other slide. I got a couple slides I forgot to put in, but it's all right. Here's a picture of the wood from Noah's Ark. Peddled around, people told this is the wood of Noah's Ark. Only curious thing, when Randall Price and his group took a picture of the same wood, not the exact same piece, but piece that they were given, said it was Noah's Ark, this is how it looked. It was white. Somehow, in some way, same wood is colored to be more wood-like when it's shown in a group of mixed people as Noah's Ark wood. On the right-hand side, it looks like stone. On the left hand, they try to make it look like wood. Both of these pieces are not wood at all. Oops. They are both what they call volcanic tuff, um, f which is basically a kind of rock. That's what the geological um, expedition proves. Ge is not, not wood at all, but a geological rock. Okay. So, what I'm going to say is what I know about the search for Noah's Ark through history is primarily a bunch of claims but when you go to inspect them to see what it says, it all seems to have problematic things. Same with the issue of these guys from Nambi. They come from China. They think nobody can check out what they say. People check it out, and it doesn't follow. There's even evidence of the local guys who carry the stuff, help people climb the mountain, of them taking wood to the top because they were told they are being made a structure for a movie. And once it got up there, then it became converted around. There are pictures even of the wood, and I, I just can't do everything tonight. And you can tell it's modern wood because there's a chip off, and it's white as can be, but they had kind of covered it with ash and, to make it look old. So when you get to investigate, it's kind of problematic. Now, when Meyer and Widmer from the Adventist Review talked to me, it wasn't about Namby. He wasn't concerned about... Uh, he wasn't concerned about... Uh, James Bryce or ha 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 Gopi Gopian and all those guys. He didn't care about that. He was concerned because Adventists all around the country were calling him because an Adventist was around making claims that he had found Noah's Ark. Now, fortunately, uh, the way I do, I mean, I just finished a book review. One of the things I try to do is, as a scholar, you have to write articles, but you also have to write book reviews. And when I uh, the most recent one I did was about this thick. It was about six, seven hundred pages. I don't know why I chose that one. Uh, and it was uh, it was on the Jewish hist. Oh, it was on the uh, Jewish history in the first uh, in the second temple period. That was the name of it. Jewish history. 
Man, 600 pages. I'm an Old Testament guy. Why would I do that to myself? But what I do is I sit down with a piece of paper, and as I'm reading, I make notes about what what I think about this, what I think, oh, there's the question. I'll write about that. And, and so when I get done, then I sit around and I write out what I had questions about, try to search it and try to delineate it. And so every subject, I kind of do the same way. And when Myron asked me to do it, I got a copy of the book and what people said. I did everything I could do to see what it was said, to be as careful as I could, and then to see whether or not uh, there was verification to it at all. Now, working on Mount uh, traditional Mount Ararat is not necessarily easy. It's a fairly easy climb, but it can be very steep, and people have died doing it. There are crevasses across the top. There are what are some people call uh, soap lava. So when it gets wet, it's very slippery and easy to fall. Jim Irwin was there. Now, I told you about um, John McIntosh, I thought I was done with him. John McIntosh went back several times, always trying to get permission. And one year he showed up and he was trying to get permission. And somebody said, hey, by the way, do you know that Jim, uh, Jim Irwin, ever heard of Jim Irwin? He was one of the guys that walked on the moon, said one small step, okay. Uh, he said, you know, Jim Irwin's here trying to find Noah's Ark. I said, really? Well, how can I meet him? So he goes across town, meets him. And, he's, and they said, he told him what he was going to do. He's going to use helicopters and all kind of things. So he said, hey, can I join your group? Oh, they said, oh, you know, we just have a full team. We can't take one more person. So John kind of disgustedly still can't speak any, uh, any Turkish or Kurdish, goes back to his room and uh, figures out, I'm just going to have to do this again by myself. And uh, the next morning, someone from Jim Irwin's team shows up at the door. Hey, somebody got sick from the altitude. You want to go with us? So you better believe it. So he did. Every year that Jim Irwin was on Noah's, uh, searching for Noah's Ark, John was part of that team. And so uh, that was part of the searching. They went out in helicopters like this, looking around, and they would sit down as best they could, and they would hike to a place and check it out uh, as they went along. Uh, one time Jim Irwin got kind of sick himself. He went down the mountain. They didn't see him for two or three days, and they discovered he had fallen. And they, here they have him found. They're getting him ready for taking him off the mountain. Uh, quite an exciting adventure they had. Once John went by himself in a year that Jim Irwin didn't go. And on the way up he got caught by bandits. He had two or three women with him and another man or something like that. And uh, they caught them. They bound them. They took them another mile down the mountain. They said, okay, this is the end of you. Took all their gear, burned all their gear. Posed them like they were going to shoot them. John said to me, I thought I was going to die. And then they just started laughing and they just took a picture of him and didn't kill him after all. So John and his friends hightailed down the mountain. The police, the local police, came back up the mountain. They found the guys who did this. Here's the police coming up the mountain. And they killed one of the guys uh, who had taken him captive and threatened their life. So it can be quite a serious thing. What the modern researchers do now are look for anomalies. They, they take, when I was with John, a great big lenses of their camera and they take pictures and they try to find anomalies. You can go up and now, but they weren't able to go up in the many years that uh, from like 81 on on for a long time to the early 90s and they allowed, not since I've been there. But they look for these anomalies and when they get there they tried. And here's a picture they took. John said he came to the purpose of, they were all too scared to get there. He took his camera, uh, I think this is the one, took, the, yeah, took his camera, held it off the edge, took a picture. And when he got back home to, to get it produced before digital, he found Noah's Ark right. They thought, oh, why did I do that? We were so close. I could have just looked. He came back the next year, same spot. This time he had ropes so he could look over and found that this uh, thing was about this far down. It wasn't Noah's Ark. It was just a, a strange looking rock right there. It wasn't anything after a whole expedition they prepared for it. Here's the eye of an eagle, eagle. One where he went and they thought for sure this is the corner of Noah's Ark in there and it was just some outcropping. That wasn't it. How about this one? Woohoo! This has got to be Noah's Ark. But when they climbed there, they found it was not Noah's Ark. It was just another strange formation. How about this one? Way off in the distance, you can see Noah's Ark. Well, when they got done investigating that, they discovered that somebody had messed around with a photograph. With a photograph. It wasn't anything but somebody had doctored. So, where is Noah's Ark? Well, here's another possible uh, suggestion that people have made and the one that that uh, Myron Woodward wanted me to work on the most and that is the Darupiner site. Now the Darupiner site 
was known long before, not, not, not long before, but Drupner found he was a captain in the Turkish army and he had a job of scanning and looking over uh, satellite imagery. And as he was looking over, he saw that, that picture and this picture actually came from Life magazine. It was featured on the head, cover of Life magazine as Has Noah's Ark Been Found? And uh, Drupner's name has been attached to so this is like in the 60s. And people went to investigate it. One of the most famous explorers that has ever lived went to, to investigate this. Uh, you might have heard of him. Ever heard of George Vanneman? George Vanneman got together a group, a group including the, my, the predecessor to my museum, the Horn Archaeological Museum. Siegfried Horn went along and they wanted to see the site. They went there for three days and they used such technical instruments as dynamite to blow up pieces. They had geologists with them. At the end of three days they said, nah, this is just a common geological formation. That was in the 60s. But someone in the late 70s came along and said he had discovered Noah's Ark. He really discovered the Drupner site, which is known for 20 years before that. Uh, and so what are we going to say about the Drupner site? Who was it that discovered it? Well, a guy by the name of Drupner, the Turkish captain. And then we're going to answer some other questions. What is a molecular frequency generator? How much petrified wood has been fun, found? Are the standing stones really anchors? The case of the hidden wall? the Telltale Rock Formation, and the Valley of Many Secrets. Let's kind of do them. Here's a picture. I actually went there myself. I, I try, you'll see even tomorrow that I will try to visit every site that I can. Yes? Just to be clear, this is the site that Ron Wyatt... This is the site that Ron Wyatt has said, and it'll be very clear in a minute. But uh, I, I went there myself in, in 90, uh, 06, I told you, after we went around to Bayezet. We came out to uh, look at this site. Me and a few uh, other people, my wife, uh, Larry Cruz and his wife Sharon, and then John McIntosh, the group of us came here. And this is how the site uh, looked. Okay, here's the book in which I got all the details that, I, that I'm going to share with you tonight from here on out. A uh, picture of the, of the book as it is. Uh, I have no, what they say, I have no pony in this race. Doesn't bother me. I'm, nobody would be happier than I would be to find Noah's Ark. Uh, but... I'm going to say it's Noah's Ark when I know it's Noah's Ark and I can tell you the truth. I'm not going to say anything beyond what I can tell you. Now, when I saw uh, this book, I made a bunch of notes. One of them was a list of people who said it was Noah's Ark. I don't know if you ever heard of John Bar Baumgarten before, but he is a respected scientist in Los Alamos in uh, New Mexico. I, I gotta get, I've called him on the phone, but I've never gone to see him. I have to go and see him sometime. But I called him and I, and I saw his name because it says that he believed in that this was Noah's Ark. So I called him on the phone and I said, Dr. Baumgarten, I want to ask you about Noah's Ark. I understand. I saw the video. I saw you on there and you said this is Noah's Ark. Are you sure of that? He didn't say anything. I actually thought he'd hung up on me. I, 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 I said, are you there, Dr. Dr. Baumgarten? He said, yes, I'm here. I said, I, I saw you on the video, you're kind of hesitant now, what's the deal? He said, you know, when we got to that site, I, you know, I said, I am a creationist. I don't know if you know it or not, but they had an article about him in Time Magazine probably 10 years ago now, talking about his model for creation. But he said, I am a creationist. I believe in the literal flood. And when I saw this, this uh, formation, I thought, Yes, this has got to be it. And he said, I made some wild statements about it. He said, that's true. But after we were there two or three days and I got to looking at it, I realized it was a natural formation. And I have begged them to stop using me uh, in what I said those first two or three days, but they refuse. So he said, I'm stuck with the statements, even though I no longer believe that it's true. And David Fossil, just like Mr. Wyatt was going around to all the Adventist churches, David Fossil, and I want you to remember his name, he was going around to all the evangelical churches. And David Fossil and I spoke on the phone a couple of times. The last time we spoke, he said, you know, it's gonna, this site is going to be proved to be Noah's Ark, and you, I hope you're not alive to hear about it. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm uh, still alive. I don't know about him. I haven't heard about it from him. But it's kind of curious, uh, those two kind of things. And then when they were wor investigating the site, now I've been an archaeologist I would say, I wouldn't say professional, but I started in archaeology about the time 
most of you were thought of in your parents' twinkling eye. 1974 was the first site I went to. And since then, I grew up the ladder until I was a pretty high person, until I was, to most archaeological sites, a, a, a dedicated guest. When I showed up at a site, I really wrote people ahead of time. They honored me. They took me around. They showed me all their stuff. So I know a lot of people in archaeology. In all of those years, no one has ever mentioned um, using a molecular frequency generator. A molecular frequency generator. I, I did all kind of work trying to find out what it was. I finally, someone found it for me in a treasure hunting magazine advertising a molecular frequency generator for finding gold and other metal. You tile in certain things and you can identify gold and so forth. I've never seen it used in an archaeological site, but it's the kind of thing that was used in this particular site. All right, here's a picture from the book of uh, Mr. Wyatt as he mapping out his site. He's finding all these metal pieces along here and laying it out like as well here, finding all the, where all the studs were for the boat and so forth and the nails that were used. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know how to identify that, but that, that's usually what is there. In the book, there are two pictures like this called a certificate analysis. Now, Believe it or not, you're probably the 100th group I've made this presentation to. One group I made a pres this presentation to were a group of geologists. They invited me to speak at Andrews University. There was probably 100 of them there. And uh, I made this presentation and we got to this point. And uh, I, I mentioned this. Uh, and what, what this certificate is, it shows uh, the carbon level. The carbon level. And there's two pictures side by side. I just didn't, I didn't put them both in here. One is of dirt outside of the supposed ark, and the other is the dirt inside the Noah's ark, because the dirt inside the ark is not supposed to be dirt, it's supposed to be wood. And the point of the piece in the, in the written part is that, of course, this is proof that this is Noah's ark, because the carbon level inside the Noah's ark is higher than the carbon level of the dirt outside the Noah's ark. Isn't that impressive? It was impressive until one of the persons in the back row said, Dr. Merling, Dr. Merling, said what? He said, well, both of them are in the same area as common dirt. Both the carbon layers are still within the range of carbon dirt, common, uh, common dirt. So it is true that the carbon level is higher on the inside of the formation, now, but it's still in the level of common dirt. It's not evidence of wood. It's just a different carbon level in, in, other, in different areas. So you might have even more carbon somewhere else. Okay, this is the kind of thing that I check out. Okay, here we go. Who, who here is an expert on petrified wood? Anybody? Do you think I know a thing about petrified wood? I am an archaeologist. I am not a geologist. An archaeologist, I deal with the remains, not of human bodies. That's a, what, anthropologist. I call the anthropologist when we find a skeleton. I am an archaeologist. I deal with the artifacts of humans and how they're found and how they build their houses, right? I don't know anything about geology. So when I don't know about it, you know what I do? I don't make it up because that's embarrassing. I find out somebody who does know. So here's the claim. Train loads of petrified wood are present in the formation, but there's little to be found in the rest of eastern Turkey. All right, good. If you truly believe the biblical description of the earth before the flood, we know that there couldn't possibly be any growth rings in pre-flood wood. Because when I'm there at that site, I'm picking up, to me, looks like rocks because there are no... Um, ever seen petrified wood? Yeah. I it looks like... It, it looks like hard wood because it's been petrified, right? But this, these inside that formation looks like rocks because there are no tree rings. His answer is if we truly believe the Bible is covered the earth before the flood, we know there couldn't possibly be any growth rings in pre-flood wood. Do I know anything about petrified wood? No. But I am smart enough to know when I don't know something. That, that's a key thing. If you want to be a scholar, you got to know what you don't know as well as what you know. Right? So what do I do? I find somebody who knows something about this and I write him a letter. This is a letter. I wrote a letter to Harold Coffin. Not only did I write him a letter, I took the chapter on, on why it has a whole chapter on 
growth rings and why you don't have them. I mailed that to Harold Coffin, who used to teach at PUC. He's now long since retired. This is his letter. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is the way it starts out. I recently read Ron Wyatt's book, Discovered, Noah's Ark, and was... That means excited. That means uh, thinking it was a great thing. It is one of the most, what's the word? Disgusting. Disgusting books I've read. Naturally, I have no problem with the discovery of Noah's Ark, but the multitude of inaccuracies and errors certainly turns one off who has some information. Down to the other underline. I have spent years studying petrified trees in various areas of North America, in Patagonia and in Australia. They have growth rings if they are trees that normally are expected to have rings. So palm tree, no growth rings because they're not like that. But trees like um, all the other trees, the deciduous trees have growth rings. That's the nature of it. This is a letter sent to me by Harold Coffin and even his signature at the end. And you're welcome to read the whole thing. If you want to at the end, I'll take time and let you just read it. Uh, it just goes on and on. His mistaken concerning frozen mammoths, he accepts dinosaur track and all these other things. They're just not acceptable. All right. I have to tell you, I'm a little bit devious. This is one of my favorite of the many things I found in this. Notice with me. Why it's the Turkish government, just above the yellow, the Turkish government has given the credibility to Mount Wy uh, Mr. Wyatt's discovery by building a four-lane highway to the site along with a visitor center which is now open to the public. Again, a new super highway leading to the visitor center soon to be built overlooking the remains of Noah's Ark. By the Turkish government has given a credit, same book, the Turkish government has given credibility to Mr. Wyatt's discovery by building a four-lane highway to the site along with the visitor center, which has now opened the country. Last one, still six-lane and possibly eight-lane. Somehow in this discussion, the, the, the lanes are growing wider to the same site. Still working on what is at least a six and possibly an eight-lane highway, which leads to the site. So when I get to the site, what do you think I'm expecting to find? You think I'm expecting to find something? It looks like that. That's the road that goes to the site. That's the road I saw when I got there to lead to the site. Now, how many of you knew that? That's counted on. Because I could write and say it was a 10 lane road. How would you know the difference? Unless you went to check it out, which is what I did in uh, 06 before I wrote the article to make sure that I knew what he was talking about. And of course, was there a visitor center? There was. This is the visitor center that was built. There was a little bitty guy who slept in the place. He had a little cot with his cow pies in a stove. I'm, so, I'm not a very good photographer. This is the picture on the inside. You can see the little guy with a hat. And they're looking from where his little cot was to the other room, which was totally empty of anything. There he was. And then Mr. Wyatt says that he found anchor stones scattered all around, um, all around uh, near his site, all leading the site. So the picture that he paints is that as Noah's going along, he's kind of guiding the ship and he's dropping these anchor stones and that's causing the boat to kind of veer one way and the other. You know, I'm kind of, I guess, simplistic. I thought God was leading the boat. I thought that somehow Noah's Ark was totally dependent on God. But uh, in, in Mr. Wyatt's scenario, that's not the case. They are following along and Noah's dropping the sand. So here is uh, anchor stones. Now, I, my, my expertise is a very narrow thing. PhD, the, you know, you have, somebody has a PhD, you're going to study how many, how many bugs have left legs versus how many have right legs. I mean, you, you gotta, you know, you gotta be expert. I'm an expert on the archaeology of the late Bronze Age. That's my expertise. So you asked me something about that. At one time, when I was really doing archaeology regularly, I could have told you everything about it. But now I'm kind of got a little bit shifty. I don't know everything. I just make up stuff. But uh, I have a friend who's an archaeologist of Armenia, which is Eastern Turkey. So what do you think I did? I took this picture and I took it to my friend and I said, hey, tell me about this, uh, this anchor stone. He said, what? Well, I said, tell me about this anchor stone. He said, do you think that could all be an anchor stone? 
I said, that's what somebody's saying. He said, did you ever notice that little bitty hole up there? And that small piece of, uh, of stone that was supposed to carry this big honking tonnage of stone? Did you think that might break up? I'm just asking. I don't, you know, I don't know. Uh, he said, that's not an anchor stone. He said, if you look, you'll find that every one of those things like this, uh, like these stones, are in, to, uh, are in uh, burial places. And pagans before Christianity used to have these big standing stones and they made these niches in the top so they could put uh, lamps up in them. So you have a lamp that would shine out this way and one that would shine out that way. That's why it's a hole. And he said that's what they did. And when Christians came, they changed them over and put Christian signs on them. That's why you have crosses on them and so forth. It's not an anchor stone. It is a tombstone of marking where all the cemeteries were. Now, Interestingly enough, one of my students, after I gave this presentation, told me he had been up, at, here's the Bay that down here, this is where Noah's Ark is in that area to the uh, east of there, up in Kors, he found another one up there. So either Noah was wandering around and lost for a while, or he <laughs> didn't know that he was supposed to be laying those stones out because they're only in cemeteries of pagan people, not anything else. I, through Larry, who speaks a little Turkish, I ask him, uh, tell me about the excavation, the old man who was there. Where's the excavation? And he brought us to this point and showed me this hole and said, he, dug, he drilled in there and it's from there that they got all the hairs from the animals from Noah's Ark that they display down in Tennessee. It's from that hole. That's the only excavation there. Now, let's talk about the site itself. At the back of the book is this picture. When I looked at the picture right from the beginning, I thought, boy, this is odd. Uh, you know when you, you go to Washington Monument and you want to get a picture of the Washington Monument, how many times do you put the monument there and you got your head there? Your head and there's the monument. Don't you usually stand beside it? Why would you take a picture with your head near Washington's Monument or the, the Capitol building or something? I, that, I said, that is odd. When I got to the site, I knew exactly why. Because if we had a picture of his whole body, we would also be able to see what I call the wall. Because there is beside this strange formation a wall that springs out as though the ark had a line left out and the, the line turned into a big wall. And the only way not to see that is to picture yourself in such an angle where you only see the formation in your head. And I'm telling you that whatever caused the formation also caused that wall to be right there. All right. This is a look again. I'm sorry. I don't have good contrast here. But along in here, here's the same kind of formation. Looks just like that one up there. The only difference is that this one uh, has a stone outcropping in the middle of it, which is what caused the formation. Let's look at it again a little bit. Here you, here you see what I'm saying. I'm not a geologist. I can't explain this exactly. But what I know from my geology friends is, that whatever reason, this ground is very um, easily moved along. And at some time, when this earth was shaking along, the dirt kind of came down the mountain. It hit this rock. And when it hit the rock, what did it do? It divided and went around it making a formation, just like you put your hand in the bathtub and water came in and it went around it. That's what it did and made this uh, formation as it is. Here again, another picture of the outcropping that caused the formation. Notice that that's at the widest width there. And uh, uh, so there it is. And here, someplace, here's my wife. She's on there uh, picking up, looking for pottery pieces. See, our whole life, we've been archaeologists. We always look and find pottery. That's what you find where people are uh, inhabiting a place, unless it's a prehistoric site. She found no kind of pottery whatsoever and no other kind of human worked artifacts. Uh, all right, I got this letter in 93. I only put this here because uh, Mr. Wyatt, when he was alive, told many people I never talked to him, never had anything to do with him. Here's a letter he wrote me in 93 when I was working on the article. And this is what I would say towards the end of my presentation at the end of his book. Multiple times in the last chapter or two, this is what he said. The Lord chose me. 
And what I would say, looking at the, what I would call the evidence, the choice is between whether there's evidence or whether there's not. When I was dealing with Mr. Piankowski, who is a guy who is his artist and made his little flyer up on uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, when he and I were talking, he would say to me, Pastor Merling, you have to have faith. You can't go by scientific inquiry and, 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 uh, and by logic. He said, you have to go by faith. And I would say that, I said to him 10 times, we repeated the same story. I said, I do have faith. I have faith that Jesus died for me and that I'm going to be saved because of that. I have faith that God created this world. Anything else. I have faith in the Bible. I don't have faith in any human. I have to see the evidence. And that's what I want to see, the evidence. And he would say, well, there is evidence. You have, those, uh, you have these anchor stones. Said, well, those anchor stones, you know, anyone who knows him about history have found them all over the place. They do not line up. They don't do anything to the story. There are no, there are no tree rings in the wood, you know, like Mr. Wyatt says, it doesn't fit. Earlier I mentioned, I don't know if any of you remember, David Fossil. Any of you remember that? That guy? I told you he worked the evangelical group. He went to Australia on TV with a panel of geologists. And in there, they were arguing and discussing it. And, and David Fossil said to the geologist, look, you go to eastern Turkey with me and I will prove to you that it's Noah's Ark. They went to him to eastern Turkey, the geologist who could explain the formation better than I can. And when that day was over, he was convinced that this was a natural formation, not a building of Noah's Ark. Notice the title of his article. And he wrote it with two, one other guy. Bogus Noah's Ark from Turkey. Exposed as a common geologic formation. David Fossil. The guy said, I hope that I wouldn't be alive, but he did. Here's what I'm going to tell you. What I understand from the book and elsewhere, from all the people who talk to me, all, the, all of his disciples say the same thing. You have to have faith, Pastor. You can't go by the logic. I'm going to say I have faith in the Word of God and nothing else. I'm going to trust only in there. And this is where I'm going to get what I'm going to say the point of tonight is. Reading from Luke chapter 16, 31, he that is Father Abraham said, because you remember in the, in the story of the rich man of Lazarus, the rich man says, send my, bro send my help down to my brother. And if they send, they send, you send Lazarus, he'll come from the dead and they'll believe it. Jesus said, no, they won't. No, they won't. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. I'm telling you, even if we found Noah's Ark and we found the Ark of the Covenant, which we're talking about tomorrow, and if we found the Red Sea crossing, my friends would say, oh, I wonder where that tradition came from. What is it that converts people? It's the Holy Spirit. It's not even artifacts. As much as I love ancient artifacts and have spent my life collecting them and finding them, when it comes to salvation, it's really trusting in God and the Holy Spirit working. We can find any artifact you want. Not one person will be truly, truly saved because of that. I believe the words of Jesus Christ through this story, talking about through Father Abraham, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rose from the dead. Again, from 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 4, For the time will come when they are not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn their, away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to miss. Again, I believe the Apostle Paul knew what he was talking about. That people today are more likely to believe strange tales than look for anything in the Bible or trust in Jesus Christ. I don't want to have that uh, story said about me. So let's go. Uh, I'm not as long as I thought. What is it? 9 o'clock? 8.30? Oh, good. You're, I'm better. You're lucky. I did the shorter <laughs> version. Okay. What should you do? Here's the deal. What should you do when something seems too good to be true? I'm just going to tell you, this is the same thing I would tell my own children. When they come and tell me, hey, dad, papa, somebody can give me, for $10, I can buy this device that can make gas out of water. 
What should I do? What should, I, what should they do? I'm going to tell you the same thing I would tell my children. Automatically assume if it's too good to be true, it is too good to be true. Number two, do not invest your money until you invest your mind. In other words, you should try to verify things and actually logically consider what's being said. Number three, verify everything you can for yourself. When I was working on those articles, I got a call from Myron Widmer, the review, Adventist Review Assistant guy. He called me one night and said, Pastor, I was down in, I was down in uh, uh, Nashville. I was in the home of Mr. Wyatt. And you know what? He is so sincere. He said, are you sure about your article? Mr. White is so sincere. I said, Myron, let me ask you a question. Did you think he was going to be insincere? He said, no, you don't understand. You don't understand. He was really sincere. I said, Myron, let me ask you a question. Did you think he was going to be really insincere? We did that ten times until he finally said, are you sure? I said, absolutely. By the evidence that's given, there is no evidence. Sincerity is not evidence. Being related to somebody is not evidence. Being a Seventh-day Adventist is not evidence. Let me tell you, the devil's going to come, and how's he going to come? With insincerity written on his head? I think he's going to come as a Seventh-day Adventist wearing a black suit and a white tie and be very thin. And he's going to be very sincere. And everybody's going to say, praise the Lord, the redeemed one has come. Because he's going to seem sincere, he's going to look sincere, he's going to sound sincere, and people are going to flock to follow the devil. That's my prediction of the end. I believe it with all my heart. When I see how people flood to accept no evidence and call it evidence, it is shocking to me. All right, if everything you verify everything you can yourself, seek special knowledge that is expertise for those who are objective. So, as I've told hundreds of people who came to me, don't take my word for it. Take the, in the book, take the uh, analysis of the, of the ground. Go to the University of Virginia. Go to the University of New Mexico and ask them, what is the value? Is this say this is wood? Or what is it? He's gonna, they're going to tell you, it is dirt. That's somebody who's objective, who doesn't have a pony in that race. You understand what I'm saying? So we, you go to somebody who can verify. You can even ask me because I try to go to those places and, and find out myself. All right, number five. Do not be influenced by tears, Emotive stories and testimonies from disciples. I can't tell you how many people say, I saw him and delivered this. He was crying. He was so sincere. You know, if I go to buy a car, I don't care if the car salesman cries. Do I care? I hope he cries when I cut the deal. Then I'm going to say I got okay. But I'm not going to buy the car if he says, you know, I'm going to lose my house if I don't make the sale and I'm going to, kids are going to go to school and I'm not going to... Those, that's not my, those are not my problem. I'm going to stick with why I'm going to believe. And when I believe, it's going to be based on God's word or evidence from scripture. So I'm not going to be involved with or worried about tears, emotive stories, and testimonials for disciples. I'm going to follow God's word. And the best of all, I'm going to let the kids go to bed. <laughs> any questions, help yourself. Ask any question on any subject, any time. I don't, except for what I'm talking about tomorrow. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I had on the phone. He said I never had. That's oh, the only reason I, he said. But that's why I put the letter. We, he and I talked once or twice on the phone and then he wrote me the letter, sent me the same video everybody else saw as though that would be, it was the same thing I'd already seen uh, with my partners. He just sent the... Ron the only one that thinks that's uh, Noah's Ark? No, there's a whole cadre of people that are in the same level. Mostly are his disciples. Because we have the same problem when you get down to it, it's a geological formation. Even though he has disciples that are still, the very night that I'm doing this here, they're scattering around the, the United States telling people that this is Noah's Ark. But when you get to a serious science, I don't know a serious science well, who would sincere about it. I've heard that uh, measurements of that formation comes out to be just what it is. You know, that's, th that's a good point. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, it is true, and this is, I went with P. Nikowski about this. <laughs> we spent 10 minutes on this. It is true, it's roughly the same length. 
I, I, I don't deny. How can I deny it? It's roughly the same length if you assume, if you assume that the cubits of pre-flood uh, period were the same length of cubits afterwards. You have to assume that, but we don't know that. But if you assume that, that is true. It is twice as wide. It is. No, it's about the same length. Same. No, they're not. No, they're not. Uh, now I've been around Piankowski, and we went around this a dozen times. He said. Well, that's, that's only because you're going by half the evidence. You have to go by the evidence that the length is about right. I, I agree, the length is right. The width is twice as wide. And he said, but no, you don't understand. The length is right. I said, I understand that, but I'm telling you the width is wrong. It's only half, it's twice as wide, and therefore it's 50% correct. But you can't go by 50% when you're going by evidence. So I, I've been around that horn a bunch of times. It's the, roughly the same length if you assume that the cubits of pre-flood time is the same as the cubits after that time. It is roughly the right length, but it's twice as wide. Yes, sir? The cubit is based on hand size? Well, you know, it's supposed to be the length of the forearm. The forearm. But, you know, there were three different cubits uh, in existence. They had the royal cubit and they had a couple others. I don't, I don't remember all the details, but at least three different cubits at different times. I don't know if people were growing longer or what, but they had different cubits. And I would just say I'm always cautious to think that everything from the pre-flood period transports automatically to the post. I don't have evidence for that, so it's hard for you to make that assumption. Yes? Now, if uh, cubic is from here to here, back in your days, they would pick people. Th there you go. We're just a <coughs> midget compared to Olympic. Right. Well, if that's the case, then that's not the right size. But I grant, I give that, I don't really worry about when something's right. I don't mind saying it. But what about the terrain to get to this door, where this door is it easy? Yeah. You, you just road? drive down there. There's a road. It's, it's on the main road to, I want to say, uh, it's not Iran. If you get to Iran, you're on the main road to Iran, and you turn off the road to go up the road I showed you. No. You just, it's a low-lying hill. Um, I don't know what the, well, if you, if you looked at the picture, what happens, I showed you the road. You go to the end of the road, there is a police station there. Then you go around the road, and you know, it might be 500 feet up. But you just drive around the road, and there it's on the left-hand side. So it's not like uh, Arida. It's not a, pff, nothing like that. This is in low-lying hills, because it's still in the area of, uh, uh, yeah, it's still in the mountains of Ararat. It's just low-lying hills in that area. It's just all in the same geographic boundary of the Urartu. So it certainly fits. It certainly fits in that. I wouldn't take away that. So it would have been easy for Noah to let the animals loose and they could have rolled Yeah, the that's they true. That's true. They wouldn't be going down a cliff. They wouldn't be in a low-lying area. That's true. Yes, ma'am. Now, when you did talk to Ron White on the phone, may I ask you as far as how the conversation went? Oh, it was very, what I remember, it's been a long time ago, but very amiable. And uh, he said, I heard you're writing articles. I said, I am. He said something like, well, I'd like to send you the most recent video. I said, fine, help yourself, glad to hear it. And uh, so it was a very two minute conversation. He sent me the same video I had just seen. It wasn't anything recent about it. I, I have to tell you, when I, when I do research, uh, and when I, my other friends do research, I never get a video from them. I always find it curious that people People do that. I mean, I get a, I might get a video from the wedding. Somebody gonna send me. Oh, I'm gonna send you a wedding video, and you know. But when it comes to technical things, most people want to see a drawing. They want to see actual this or actual that. So you don't really get in anything what I call quote unquote scientific a video. Now, and I'm not saying that an archaeological site wouldn't show a video because I think once we did a video, uh, we had some people at the site and they kind of demonstrated all that started from the beginning and then showed everybody saying goodbye at the end. But we didn't send it out as evidence that we did the archaeological work because when you do scientific work, you do it for a scientific audience. And scientific audience expect to see something that they can measure, handle. Even when we find pottery pieces, I mean, you talk about boring. I, I, you know, I like to tell them when I was doing regular archaeology work, I always like to tell people, the best part of being an archaeologist is being on the plane. You're sitting next to somebody and they say, what do you do? And I say, 
I'm an archaeologist. And they always say the same thing. Oh, I wanted to be an archaeologist. Instead, they're, they're a, an engineer making three times or four times what I make. They're a medical doctor, you know, knocking down a million dollars or whatever. I can't hardly feed my family because I'm an archaeologist. That's the, that's the best. But you know what we do for a living? We, we find a site, we collect all the pottery, and then we take the pottery. We have to draw careful drawings of it. We take pictures of it. and We, we might even do analysis. I did a re research paper where I did analysis on what we call ironware, uh, black ironware. And I had to take, I went to the University of, Ten of Arizona State and worked with a guy who did x-ray work. We crumbled it up and all that. Then we have to draw it up in nice little drawings of what it looked like when it was whole. You know how long that takes? How boring that is to do that? Why? Why don't I just take a video and just shoot a video? Here's the, here's the pottery. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't be helpful because people want to examine what I said. I said this is iron two. They want to be able to look at that piece and go to iron two pottery and see if it's the same. So video going, that's not helpful. Yes. Yes, when you did talk about that, uh -huh. um, was your conversation geared more toward what you had just mentioned to us about this claim? I, I did not, we didn't have an argument about anything. No, no, he, I'm just saying, what questions did you ask him that he was, would make him send you a video, basically? Well, he wanted to send me a video because he knew I was writing an article and he didn't want me to have an earlier video. You know what I mean? He didn't want me to have an earlier, he wanted me to base it off the newest stuff. But the newest stuff is the same as the oldest, as far as I could tell. The videos were identical. I watched them all. For tomorrow's presentation, one of them, I watched six hours of video uh, to try to be up to date on some stuff we're talking tomorrow. And, and, you know, and I will talk about one site if you want. If you have time, you want to stay here all night, it's fine with me. My wife's not, she's home sleeping, that's fine. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about, here's how this goes. I'm give an example of Sodom and Gomorrah. How about that? I'm not talking about that here. Uh, I didn't prepare, prepare something for here. I, the site where Ron White says is Sodom and Gomorrah is right below, um, uh, right below, uh, what's the place where the last stand of the Jews was in AD 70 up on the hill? Masada, right below Masada. There are formations there. And uh, he says that when you look at those formations, those formations look like a ziggurat. They look like walls of the city. And so he sees in these formations big walls to go around and so forth. I went there with a geologist. I'm an archaeologist. What was I looking for there? Pottery. pottery right? Pottery. Not one pottery piece. Curious. When I'm there with the... Okay, that's a good question. Let's go for that. I'm with that. Let me ask you, ever seen a place that's been burned up from a fire? Ever seen a house burned down? Actually, not with God. Huh? Have you? Not with the... Not with the power of God? I agree. But let me ask you this. Answer this one question. Have you ever seen fire burn something down and fill it up? You never seen something? You watch the house burn down, but it fills back up? Really? Every one of the formations that Ron, every one, of, every one of Ron Wyatt's formations burned down, but filled back up because you can still see the walls. You can still see the ziggurat. How did it burn down? Isn't that the definition of burning up? Is that it took the energy from what was there and burned it down? How then do we have the formation still standing? When the geologist was there, he said, Dave, obviously this is evidence of the flood. Because, ge because geologists have known for years that that formation was part of an ancient lake called the Lasan. And what happens is over time in the prehistoric times, this was all filled up. And uh, the lake then went away and the mountains came out of the, uh, the water came out of the mountains and came and took away it just like the wind has done of, uh, in, um, in uh, Utah at the, what do you call it, the, the Monument Valley. In the same way the water has come down the mountain. And if you look just where those formations are right up in the mountain, you can see the wadis where the water comes down. 
The geologists said, obviously, there, you can even see the layering because every year the sediment in the lake put another year and you can see those striations. Well, sure, I didn't bring that stuff, but it's easy to find. Oh, you look on the Lake Lausanne. I didn't talk about that. I didn't thought you'd be done with me after three times. So anyway, I mean, I'm just, I'm only talking about it because I didn't bring that stuff. But that's easy to find. In fact, if you go there, even I could see the striations. I'm not a geologist. But I could see we had the layering there, and then the water came and cleaned it, created those formations. No pottery, because the fire is so, and even it was so, it was so immense that we found the same, the same exact sulfur balls. We found them on the other east side of the Jordan because when the geologist saw them, he said, "Dave, I bet we can go over right across the river to Jordan when we get back and go down to the lake. We'll find them over there." And believe it or not, we took that route one because we worked on the east side. We went down there, same place, same level, found those same sulfur balls. The Lord's a bad shot. He destroyed the people over there and he shot them over here in the east side too. It's be, it's a, well, yeah, it may have covered the whole area, may have covered all of Israel, may have covered 10 million miles. But only in that geological level are those found. Those are known at other geological places. That's why the geologists knew where to find them. He just needed to find the right area. Because there's a, there's a thing he called, called leaching. That chemicals have a tendency to leach together. And when you have enough of that stuff, it will be found in little balls. So, am I, would I be happy if that was, it would be Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, I would be dumbfounded because we'd have absolutely no evidence. We'd have things that were burned down but filled up. I'd never seen anything do that before. I have to honestly say I've seen burned down houses, but I've never seen burned up houses. When they burn down, they burn down. They don't burn up. In, in Mr. White's place, they burn down and fill up. Do, uh, the walls are there. The houses are there. Everything's there. And there's no evidence of them. But there's evidence of them. And to me, that's not logical. Well, the walls of the house or the walls of the... Uh, he, he says they're cities. Of the walls around the city. He, around he, the all this stuff is in his one book. If you have that one book, I think there are pictures in that one book. You can see the striations in that book. If you look carefully, now that I've been there with a the gel, you can still see those striations in that book. It's not brain science. They're right there to be seen if you know what to look for. But next time you've seen a burned down house, ask somebody, what happened to houses but house burned down? Why isn't it burned up? Because you don't build, burn something down and then build it up. And when you burn something, you do burn it down. Mr. Wyatt's stuff is still standing according to him. There's still a ziggurat that's been burned down. There's still walls of the city still there. There's still, you know, he sees the castles on the corner. They're still there. How is that possible? I don't think it's possible. But, if, you know, if you say his word is equal to science and that you're going to make take his word over anything else, well, anything's possible. You know, somebody came along and said, my wife used to be a hula dancer before I met her, I wouldn't believe that. They could tell me 40 times. So if Mr. White is your hula dancer, I, I don't care. But I, I just saying, I certainly wouldn't be telling other people that because it makes Adventists look really foolish to believe those kind of... That's where I am the most about. I think we look well, you childish. Gamora is in the wrong place there, then. Well, I think there are other options. But I don't like to talk about other options because that's what Mr. Penkowski said. Well, what, what site do you... Do you uh, argue for? I don't argue for any site. I only talk about the evidence. I don't, I don't, my, my career does not depend on where I believe Sodom and Gomorrah is. My career does not depend on where is Noah's Ark. My career is in the Bible and teaching God's word. And I'm going to stay by that. That's the only thing I know is secure. Not any human anywhere. That's embarrassing to me. Uh, I'm just not going to do that. So I, there are other options for Sodom and Gomorrah, and I've been to them, and I've, some of them seem to me better. But uh, I'm not going to take a natural formation and try to make it into a, uh, uh, to a, a city or anything else. So anyway, more, any other questions? Must be past your bedtime to give up on me. Anyway, we'll see you in, in the morning. All right. So t don't miss tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning I'm going to talk about really something that's close to my heart. And uh, it's the, one of the, present the only presentation of the series I'm doing here that is not about these ideas. It's really found in the Bible and I think I'm going to shock you.
you're going to be shocked. Uh, what's next? That's the tomorrow morning. Don't miss that. Be early. Sit in the front seat, not in the back. <laughs> you don't want to miss. You don't know what it might happen tomorrow. So come. I, I want to thank Dr. Merlin for coming in tonight and, and sharing. Um, thank, thank you very much for asking. I appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, don't be don't be shy to ask questions. He's he's handled them all. So. Um, uh, we, we encourage you to come back tomorrow. Um, like you said, 11 o'clock will be his, uh, during our, our church service, main service, he'll have a uh, presentation during that, and then we'll have a fellowship lunch, uh, and then he'll have the two presentations in the afternoon on the, the Dead Sea Crossing, I mean the Red Sea Crossing and the Exodus, and then he'll be discussing um, the Ark of the Covenant um, as his final uh, presentation in the afternoon. Uh, so uh, you need to come to see how well I eat. I'm really a good eater. <laughs> that's that's worth coming right there. So. Um, absolutely. <laughs> so anyway, let's have a let's have a closing prayer, and then if you want to stay and talk to him for a few minutes privately, I'm sure he'll be happy to absolutely. chat with you. Uh, some of you may not want to ask questions in front of everybody, so he'll he'll be here for a little bit, um, especially those of you who have studied. Uh, Ron Wyatt's um, discoveries, you may have some other questions you want to talk to him about. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity